Welcome again to Get It Growing, the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners special program for all of our wonderful people who love to garden out in Acadiana. We're welcoming today Gerald Roberts, who is our parish extension agent and horticultural expert. We're here to talk to you today about your lawns, getting them growing. Thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of the LSU Ag Center and the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners, I want to thank them for affording me the opportunity to be with you all. One of the things that I have to say up front, though, on behalf of the Master Gardeners is to just remind everyone that the Master Gardeners plant, spring plant sale will be held on Saturday, April 16th uh, from 8 to 1 p.m. at the Demo Beds, Demo Garden near Aaron Nelson. Uh, if you need more information, talk to any Master Gardener. But as we get closer to that time, look for some additional information in some of the mass media outlets that we have available to the community. Yes, thank you very much, Gerald, for reminding us about that. We all want everyone to attend our plant sale this year. It will not be in association with Festival de Fleur, which has been postponed. But please make sure you attend our Master Gardener sale. It's going to be great. Okay, let's talk a little bit about lawns. Everybody's grass is starting to grow, and so are the weeds. So what do we do? <laughs> well, one of the things that I, I thought it would be appropriate to do is to talk a little bit about how we got where we are with all of the weeds that we're experiencing now. And in order to have a firm understanding of that, we have to understand that ideally, we would really wish that we did not have to apply, apply any herbicides Absolutely. to our lawns. But unfortunately, we have issues with the weather uh, that causes our lawns to struggle and be under stress. Uh, primarily when we think about what happened last summer, we had intense heat. And a really bad drought. A really bad drought. And then as we proceeded into the sp uh, fall, we had an infestation of fall army worms, tropical sod web worms, and also a disease called take all rot. A lot of unusual things are happening for us in our lawns that we had to figure out what to do. Exactly, and what most people don't realize is that once a lawn is stressed and it's weakened, then it's open to invasion from weeds. So that's, that's why we find ourselves where we are now. Now, Gerald, how can we prevent actually having to redo all of our lawns? I mean, we don't want to pull everything up and start over. Well, the main thing we have to do is understand that whether it be winter annuals or summer annuals, winter annual weeds germinate in the fall, grow through the winter, and then with the onset of heat, they actually start to decline. Summer annuals start to germinate in the mid to late spring, and they grow through the summer, and then as winter comes, they start to decline with cooler temperatures. So you need to know when the plant's growing and how to take care of it or actually kill it exactly. in, its, in its growth cycle. Exactly. Yeah. You know, in other words, a ba basic knowledge of something about the life cycle of the plant will help you to be more effective in controlling the weed. And we will say that LSU's website, the Ag Center's website, has wonderful pictures of the different weeds so that you can identify what you're looking at and know whether it's a summer, a warm season, or a cool season annual. But they also give off seed, too, right? Right. You know, when, when we look at the, the, uh, the winter annuals that you see now, when you talk about something like henbit or clover or buttercup or annual bluegrass, or common bed straw that actually will stick to your clothes. And we'll, your dogs. <laughs> and your dogs, anything. What we're, what we're talking about is people say, well, you just mentioned that the winter annuals are going to decline with the onset of heat. But they are there now. And you may say, what damage and are they, they do? Right. Well, actually, they are actually competing for nutrients. They're competing for water. They are actually going to slow your lawn grass from actually greening up. It's Coming going to delay it. Coming out of yes. dormancy. And more importantly, the longer you let them stay in your lawn, the more they mature, they're going to go to seed more and drop seeds seed. They'll make. And then right. next fall, the cycle is going to complete itself. They're back. That's right. They're back. So how can we control this at this point in the year? Okay, at, at this point in the year, 
And fortunately for homeowners, we have products on the market that are has been specifically developed to control broadleaf weeds in our lawns. Okay, there are three and four way blend materials out there, herbicides. Just make sure, number one, that it's recommended for your particular lawn. Absolutely imperative that we know it's for St. Augustine or Centipede or whatever you're growing in your lawn. Right. And basically what happens is you need to make an application and then evaluate. When we talk about evaluate, we're talking about making an application and then in 12 to 14 days evaluating how effective that application was. And whether or not we need to repeat. That's right. Exactly. You don't just automatically repeat. So this is an example of a really good product that's come out on the market that has a combination of chemicals. And these combinations are pre-emerges and post-emerges. Maybe we can explain to our listeners a little bit about the difference between a pre-emerge and a post-emerge. Okay, when you talk about a pre-emerge, you're talking about applying a herbicide that's going to prevent the weed from germinating. The seeds. The seeds. It's going after those okay, seeds. Okay, pre, before it emerges, you apply the herbicide and it's going to prevent the seeds from germinating. When you talk about, talk about post-emergence, you're talking about after emergency, after emergence coming over the top. Right. Okay, that's post-emerge. And we have materials, most of, the, most of us, the pre-emerge materials really should have been applied late last fall, around November. Correct. To prevent some of these winter weeds from germinating. That's right. Now that they're here, we're primarily now into post-emergence applications Control. of herbicides. Right. right. Okay. And when we take care of these winter weeds okay. annuals, that's only the beginning of the, the story. Because as the temperatures warm and the soil heats up, then you're going to start having warm the, the warm season annuals that are going to start to germinate. But our products that are a combination of pre-emerge and post-emerge, if we put those down now, they right. should create a barrier for those warm season weeds? It may not completely stop them from germinating, okay. but you're going to get a lot of them. You're going to stop a lot of them from germinating. And what's going to happen is you're going to lessen the competition from weeds to your lawn. You're going to lessen the times that you have to come over the top with a, a post-emergence herbicide. And basically, you're going to give your lawn the advantage to be able to grow and compete for water and nutrients. Well, so we're reading now that, that now is the time to apply mm. these products. But I'm a little concerned because I know that some of our lawns are under stress from having gone through so much stress last year. At what point do you feel like it, it's comfortable to know that our grass is out of dormancy and, and safe to spray with a product? At this point, our backs are up against the wall. Yeah. You know, the calls that I'm getting are so numerous with the weeds that are in the lawns that at this point we have to go to war on the weeds. So just go ahead and just do Just go it. ahead and do it. You know, okay. you're still going to be, we're still going to be a lot better off if we attack these weeds. And when the soil warms up, generally around the first week in April, we should where see our grass is the grass really is really going to take off. And that's actually the first time we should actually be applying fertilizer. And you know, we've talked and a about... a very good point we're going to bring yeah, up here. Great, great. You go ahead. No weed and feed. No weed and feed because... It's just too early. You know, it's just too early. We're trying to fertilize the warm season grass. We don't want to put fertilizer out there. You've got winter weeds that are still active. And you're feeding the weeds. You're feeding the weeds. And if you promote accelerated growth to the lawn grass and we get some cold temperatures that soft tender growth is going to be hurt and finally and even more importantly one of the connections that we've seen between the presence of brown patch is fertilizer fertilizing St. Augustine too early and put producing and enforcing a lush green growth that's too very soon. susceptible to brown patch so Really and truthfully, the first application should be made no later than the last of March or the first of April. 
You're talking about fertilizers. We're talking about fertilizers. Okay, so and, fer and, and the thing about weed and feeds is that the weed is the herbicide, the feed is the fertilizer. So that's why we're talking about if you want to do anything to your lawn now, apply just strictly a herbicide. herbicide. You know, because you, you've got time before the soil gets warm where we can apply the fertilizer. Now, you did mention a little bit about insects. So let's talk about insecticides a little bit and what we can do to, well, we don't prevent in insects. We always look, identify, and make sure we know what type of insect we're going after. So maybe we can help them to understand how to identify their insects. Well, one of the things that, that's available, available, if you get on the LSU Ag Center website and you type in lawn insects, you're going to find information on, number one, identifying insects, identifying their damage, and what to do in terms of trying to control them. Uh, we talked about the fall web worm. We talked about the fall army worm. We talked about the tropical sod web worms. The difference between applying an insecticide to control insects and applying a fungicide with control fungus diseases is with diseases you want to try to get on a spray schedule to pre prevent. prevent those, yes. With insect control you want to actively be out there at least a couple of times a week looking for symptoms of insect damage, looking for the insects, and only if you find the insects and you identify the insects should you be applying an insecticide. Well, I think one insect that some of us may be seeing now, although it's still cool and we know there's not a whole lot of insect activity, are fire ants. And I'm just going to break away for just a second and talk about fire ant remediation, which is also on our LSU Ag Center website. In our neighborhood, we did a fire ant remediation program where we got all of our neighbors together to participate. We bought a large commercial bag of fire ant product, broke it down into individual baggies, and provided information to all of our neighbors at a very reasonable cost and used this throughout the neighborhood and it was wonderful in how it really slowed down the insects. This was a very safe product. All it was was a uh, growth regulator that went to the queen, caused her to stop being able to reproduce, and eventually we knocked down those insects quite a bit. So that's one thing we do recommend and the Master Gardeners can help any of you if you are interested in an ant remediation program. Well, let me just add something as far okay. as fire ant uh problems are controlled. One of the things you have to, we have to accept the fact is thinking that we are going to realistically at this point totally eliminate the we fire. We will end, not do that. That's either. not going to happen. But you have to have a comprehensive plan and as you said, it can't just be an isolated neighbor. No. It has to be where everybody's on the same page and it's a, a full attack on the fire ant, you know, and you have to be persistent. Yes. Because... But it's not expensive. No. If everyone participates. That's right. If everyone participates, uh, you know, it, it's the old adage that, you know, if you, if, you, if you form a group and everybody's on the same page, you're going to be a lot stronger and a lot more effective, and it's going to be a lot less expensive for, every, for each individual and still be effective at the same time and in the end everybody benefits. Everybody benefits. It's a wonderful program. So maybe we can tell them a little bit then now about the good things we should be doing like how to water um, and how to uh, core aerate and do things that will help to make our grass stronger. Exactly. Uh, one, of the, the, one of the things I see uh, and I've been promoting and once people adopt the practice, they'll come back and tell me what a difference it made. And that's the fact that in the interest of trying to save time, most of us, when it comes down to mowing our St. Augustine lawns, our lawns, we want to cut down the number of times we go. And cut it really short. <laughs> cut it really short. And what we're doing is, all we're doing is, we're actually eliminating or depleting a vigorous root system, which is the foundation of the grass. Because it needs those little stolons to be able to That's be strong. That's right. And the leaves, the more leaf surface you have, 
the more efficient and effective it is at making food. Absolutely. You know, so mowing height in St. Augustine grass plays a critical role. It makes it stronger, more vigorous. It keeps it from being weakened. And the more, the stronger it is, the more vigorous it is, the more dense it is, the less the weeds, weeds can invade. Okay, so mowing height is very, very important, especially in areas where there is competition from trees or competition for light. It's even more critical that the St. Augustine grass is cut high. Grow it high. Grow it high. Let it go high. You mentioned something about watering. Yes, um, the city does have a watering regulation in place, and there are even in odd days, they do show that in our newspaper, and you can also call the city to find out what is the right time for you to water. Okay. But it's really important for people to know that one inch per week is about what it takes to have a good crop of grass, and one way to measure that is to take out a little can, put your sprinkler on, and time how long it takes to get an inch of water into your can. Something else that's very important is, and whether it be a lawn, a garden, a landscape bed, watering a little bit two or three times a week it's is not, not a good thing. good thing. Deep watering once a week is better than sprinkling a little bit water, a little bit of water every every day or every couple of days. Uh, when you watering your lawns, very important that you add or apply your water early in the day. We definitely do not want to be applying it late in the afternoon because it stays wet and it can cause fungus. Mo moist all night and it causes fungus disease problems. Okay. The other thing that's very, very important is that, as you said, put your little tuna cans out there. See how long it takes with your sprinkler system to collect one inch of water. And then that's, use that as a guide once, in, a, week. once a week in determining week. if we don't have any, if, if any moisture. And it may seem strange right now that we're talking about irrigation and drought, but it's not a matter of if it's going to happen. It's just when. It's just when. And unfortunately, I think people really tend to overwater. They get scared because they see that it's so warm and that, we, and, and that there's things are not growing at such a rapid pace and they water and water and I think you are so right in saying that shallow watering is just not the way to go when you're trying to grow plants properly. Plus it'll save you money once you learn how to use your water properly in an economical fashion. One of the things that I, I thought would be important is this weed here. It's called burrweed, lawn burrweed. It, it's a low growing winter annual but the thing that really gets to people is the fact that it has stickers okay if you ever walk in the yard in mid to late spring and you feel stickers that's lawn burrweed it almost looked like a low growing parsley it, it, it hugs the ground and as it matures and as it goes to seed around the little seed capsule is a spine and that's where the stickers come in. I remember that as a child. That's right. <laughs> Playing out and getting stickers all so the time. So at, at this point, if you have lawn burrweed or spurweed in your lawn, you need to apply one of those herbicides, one of those three or four way blends to try to get it under control and kill it. The longer you wait, the more mature it's going to become, the more chances you're going to have those spines. Okay. So get it early. Get it early. You know, and, and if, if you see it in, in, in January, February, depending on if we have a mild winter, the earlier you can get it, the less chance you have of having spines. If you wait until mid-April to May and you kill it, even though you kill it, you're still going to have the spines. Um, just referencing back to water for one quick second, also on weeds, dollar weed. That's the round one that everybody sees. You'll usually see it in your lawn where you have low spots because it likes moisture. Yeah. To get our, those low spots back up level, what would you suggest as a soil amendment to, so that we can level that out and get rid of those low spots in that dollar weed? I would recommend the number one priority would be a high quality topsoil. Okay. You know, something that's pretty high in organic matter something that's not going to pack and become dense 
uh, definitely not, they're not anything with K, with clay. Okay. Now, if you can't get topsoil, then just the regular, some some uh, soil from the, the bag soil. And what about sand, too? Just sand, so too. Uh, a lot of the athletic fields are top dressed with soil and even sand. And that basically helps the percolation of water, helps to reduce soil compaction, and it just, it keeps, it makes for a, actually a, a, a softer surface instead of a hard packed surface. So a lot of times our weeds can even tell us what's wrong with our soil. Exactly. Uh, if you're seeing dollar weed, you've got a low spot and you need to amend to bring your level back up. If you're seeing clover, clover, that's generally an indication of white clover, that's generally an indication of low soil pH. Uh, another one, if you see buttercup, a lot of times you'll see that in areas where it's a little low and as beautiful as it is, it can be a serious problem. So if our pH is a little low, which we do suggest always that you do a soil sample, bring it to the master gardeners and let us help you figure out what your pH is, but there are ways to raise our pH, right? Yes, uh, commonly uh, it's recommended that you use lime to raise the pH. Uh, if you're low in magnesium, you can use dolomitic lime. If you're low in calcium, you can use calcitic or agricultural lime, right. and both of those will actually raise the pH. And of course, you find out about these by going through the, uh, a soil test, in the, and the LSU Ag Center will give you a sheet telling you exactly how much you need to add and what you need to add to amend your soil properly. Now, we also talked about, and as we get into the first or second week in April, remember we talked about, that's the time to start your fertility program. Right. right now, we should be concentrating on controlling weeds. Once we get rid of those weeds and the soil warms up, we get to the first or second week in May, then we are ready to give our lawns what it needs. And that's where we start looking at the different types of fertilizers that are available. And you mentioned something about getting questions about the difference between a slow release fertilizer or quick release fertilizers like triple 13 or triple eight. The, the, the primary difference is an extended feeding. Mm -hmm. You're going to be, you're going to have, uh, you're going to pay more for a slow release fertilizer, but it's going to feed for, for several months. Right. Okay. With slow release fertilizer, you also have less chance of burning. Right. You have to come back less often. On, slow, on, on, on fast release fertilizer like triple eight or triple thirteen, it's primarily water soluble and it's quick release. So that means after five or six weeks, you need to reapply. So you definitely would yeah. recommend for the lawns a slower release fertilizer. A slower fertilizer. release fertilizer. It may cost more up front, but you got a higher quality fertilizer, less chance of burning but you and extended you feeding. You save money in the long run yeah. and you save time. That's and right. time is so important for exactly. all of our gardening chores. Right. Well, I think that we have touched on a lot of interesting information for our, uh, our listeners. We've talked about weeds. We've talked about weed products. We've talked about our ant remediation program. And uh, don't forget to call the Master Gardeners for that. And we want to remind everybody once again about our Master Gardener plant sale and swap. That's going to be Saturday, April 16th. It's going to be at the Master Gardener site, which is located off of Johnson Street behind R. Nelson near Blackham Coliseum. We're going to be offering a wide arrangement of different types of plants that you can purchase. And are we doing vegetable plants this year too? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I yes, think, we I are. Think we, yes, we are doing some vegetable Fantastic. plants. Everybody always wants to know if we're going to be doing vegetable plants, and I believe we are doing our vegetable plants this year, yeah. along with a wonderful variety of tropicals, warm and cool plants. Okay, finally in closing, just let me make a general statement about the LSU Ag Center and the Master Gardener's effort here in the Lafayette community. Our mission is to provide the general public with research-based information so that they can make informed decisions. You know, everybody know how the economy is now. Everybody know how strapped they are for time. You don't want to be out there spending money on something that you don't need. Uh, every time you make a mistake, it costs you. Also, you don't want to be out there putting out a product that you shouldn't be putting out because it takes, it takes time. So please take the time, if you're not sure, if you have a question, uh, take the time to call the LSU Ag Center office, call a master gardener. Uh, we're here for you. 
Uh, you're the reason that we exist. That's absolutely and right. Might want to close. And it is such an important, important thing for um, all of the gardeners and all of the homeowners to realize how much the LSU Ag Center does provide as far as good quality researched information to save you time, money, and effort and help you get things growing in your yard. We uh, appreciate very much that you're joining in and watching our program and please support us with our plant sale in April. Also, let me remind you all that I'm fortunate and privileged to be doing a garden talk on March 19th, Saturday, March 19th at Ira Nelson. It's going to be Turf Talk where I'll go over more information about how to maintain your lawn. Thank you and you all have a good day. <laughs> okay, we can't, I can't see those numbers on that little yellow sign. I mean, I cannot read those numbers at all. I was telling you to look at that. Y'all hadn't mentioned the garden talk. Okay, thank you for coming and pointing to that because we did miss that. What you need to do is you need to put them Yeah, because that lights, now I can see it. I can't see it up there. Not at all. So, I mean, I'm thinking I'm seeing three, and it was probably five, and I'm sorry. And then this was... I know.